Lift us up. Don't push us out. Our voice is freedom. Educational justice is the route. Educational justice happens when young people don't get pushed out of schools and classrooms where culturally relevant curriculum is slim. Mm. Police on campus, so who is really here to win? When young people have a chance of coming to school and going to jail, when does educational justice in our schools really prevail? Lift us up. Don't push us out. Our voice is freedom. Educational justice is the route. Having problems in school don't mean you can't succeed. Mm. Preschool is the start. Elementary is the introduction of things. Reading, writing, arithmetic is the government sayings. Mm -hmm. But everyone failed to realize school is where you start to feel ashamed. Ashamed of how you look. Ashamed of how you read. Even shame of your race and nationality. But I just say, transform your mind. Make school your hustle and find justice and educational equity. Lift Lift us up. Don't push us out. Our voice is freedom. Educational justice is the route. Educational justice happens when the school to prison pipeline is dismantled. Student infractions are handled without the presence of the police. Community-based educators are brought into the classroom to teach alongside teachers that believe they can reach young people where they are at instead of where they think they should be. Students in a classroom so young people can tell us what they really need to succeed. We out here thriving hard in these streets, mm -hmm. making school our hustle and striving to be the warrior scholars we are meant to be. Lift us up. Don't push us out. Our voice is freedom. Educational justice is the route. believe that uh, you know you'll hear a lot about movements and the importance of parents in particular and young people being at the core of these movements but at the same time we know that it takes a really big movement and a lot of different kinds of people to really create the change that we need in our public schools and so having uh, documentary film artists and media people and foundations and academics like myself as part of that movement is, is also very important to us so it's great to be here to engage with you around uh, these issues so I'm going to start off and talk, uh, tell you a little bit about <clears throat> the book and the story of the book and what we're trying to do with it. And then I'll turn it over to uh, contributors to the book. Uh, these folks have written essays in the book to talk a little bit about the work that they do. Uh, maybe read a little bit from the, uh, one of the essays of the book as well. So does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Then we'll have a chance for conversation. And then as I understand, we're going outside for lunch. And being from Boston, I'm very happy to be eating lunch outside <laughs> in, in November 30th instead of huddled uh, in from the cold. And we do have books for sale, and uh, we'll be selling them. And if you would like us to sign them, we'd be happy to sign them as well, too. So um, as I said, I'm a professor, um, <clears throat> probably different than many. I'm more of an activist scholar, and I've always worked in engaged with uh, community organizing groups that I've been studying and writing about. But I've been, been studying and working with uh, community organizing groups, parent and youth organizing groups, working for educational justice for really 25 years now. And for most of that time, uh, I wrote about these groups as uh, entirely kind of local affairs, what people were doing in their particular neighborhoods or cities. And you know, to a large extent, that was, that was accurate. That was really what was happening in the world of young people and parents who were trying to you know, fight for racial equity and against systemic oppression in our schools and communities. But maybe five or six years ago, things started to change. And um, local groups were now finding ways to connect with each other across their localities and uh, create a larger uh, national education justice movement. And it's not like we haven't had educational justice movements before. We certainly have had a long history of that. But it seemed like there was a renewed, something new and different was happening in that world. And so uh, something happened a few years ago that kind of sparked uh, me to, to write about this. In, in uh, August 17, 2015, a group of uh, African American parents on the south side of Chicago went on a dramatic hunger strike to save their school from closing, Diet High School. And I'm, I'm hearing a few nodding heads, so a few people have heard about this. So you may know that in many cities, not so much LA, but in many cities around the country, there was a massive wave of school closings, in, particularly in African American and Latino communities. This was in Chicago, and Detroit, and Philadelphia, New York City, New Orleans, many cities across the country. And uh, this was, Diet High School was the last remaining public high school on the entire south side of Chicago, which is, 
historic, as you may know, a historic African American neighborhood. And so the parents had tried to stop the closing and in fact had had a, a bold plan to transform the high school. Don't close it, transform it into a school of global leadership and green technology. But uh, the mayor, Rahm Emanuel, uh, uh, refused uh, to change minds and wanted to close the school anyway. And so they went on a hunger strike. And in the past, these, uh, these hunger strikers would have uh, maybe had support from their local organization, uh, the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, and perhaps around Chicago. But this time, uh, they were part of a national alliance called the Journey for Justice Alliance. And they also had at their access social media. And so they used a Twitter in particular, and they had hashtag fight for diet. It trended number one for several days. They had people around the country and actually around the world uh, supporting them through social media. Uh, nuns in Holland uh, went on a mock one day hunger strike and took photos of themselves and, and put that. So there was a, a lot of pressure started to build nationally and internationally, not just locally, on the mayor. And using the, the connections through the Journey for Justice Alliance, they were able to bring Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, to Chicago. And that was very important because up to that point, the media had had a block, blockade. Uh, there was no media coverage of the hunger strikers. But when she came to town to support them, the, uh, that kind of broke the media blockade and it ended up getting a story in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And so the story is they did deep organizing uh, amongst parents and community folks and young people on the south side. They had support in Chicago of other organizing groups and of the Chicago Teachers Union, but they also had now national and international support. And after four, 34 days, the mayor uh, capitulated and the school was saved and it was changed, transformed into a school of uh, global leadership and green technology. And G2 Brown was one of the leaders of that strike and, and became the head of the Journey for Justice Alliance. And he said this in, in an essay in the book. The hunger strike was powerful because it resonated with people all over the world who feel disenfranchised and disrespected as human beings. The sacrifice of people going on a hunger strike touched people's hearts. When people heard that folks in a low-income black community wanted a school focused on global leadership and green technology, they were inspired. Black and brown folks understand that privatization feeds the 1% and is spreading like a plague everywhere in the world, from Chicago to Chile. And now other folks are starting to recognize this reactionary trend as well. And so I start with that story in part because it's one of the essays in the book. So it gives you an idea in addition to what you'll hear here about the kinds of things that are in the book. But also because I think it's very uh, symbolic of the changes that were happening. And so by uh, within the last four or five, six years, we had the formation of the Journey for Justice Alliance nationally, uh, the Dignity in Schools campaign, which Maisie here was one of the uh, founding leaders of, a national coalition to uh, combat the school to prison pipeline, uh, also the Alliance for Educational Justice, uh, which is one of the groups involved, as we know, just today about announcing uh, a campaign to end police in schools and uh, the Alliance for, uh, to Reclaim Our Schools. But in any case, a number of these national alliances, but I think a lot of other ways that people were finding ways to connect with each other. And uh, so, you know, I'm a professor, so I thought, well, I'll write an article about this. And I did, and uh, usually we publish these articles in rather obscure academic journals that pretty much nobody reads. But this time I published it in a, uh, an online journal so that it was freely downloadable. I wanted to try something different. And it was downloaded several thousand times within the first month. So obviously it, str it struck a chord. And again, I'd like to say that certainly I'm not the first person or only person to be talking about educational justice movements, but in terms of writing about it in, a, in this more public uh, way, seemed to be a need for that. So people asked me, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I could write a book, because I write books. And I was challenged uh, in, a, in a good way, I think, by uh, some of the organizers uh, that I had been working with, like Maisie, but other people who said, well, maybe you should think differently. Why should you write the book as you know, a white male professor, which I am? Maybe instead, you could use your skills and resources to help us write our own stories, help us write our own history. And wouldn't that be different and more powerful and give us ownership over our own, full ownership over our own uh, history of movement building? And so that was the origins of Lift Us Up, Don't Push Us Out. And we got together uh, a couple times uh, in, in New York and then in Boston so that folks could share their, their you know, stories with each other. Um, and I should say, this is a book that is not primarily about the failings of our public education system. You know, our starting point is that there are really uh, systemic 
racial and class inequities in our public education system. Uh, and, but we, we really, and because of that, we really need a broad-based educational justice movement to address them. And that's what the book is about, how people are today working to build that movement, lifting up those stories, that analysis, sharing those strategies to, to write that history, but also to inspire people and share examples of what other people can be doing across the country uh, to work for educational justice. So anyway, we got together a couple times, and at the end, I said, well, that's great. This was really fun. We're going to do the book now. And people said, no, 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 we don't want to stop meeting. We're, as organizers or education activists, we're usually too busy and too stressed to really have time to just sit back and reflect with each other in maybe deep and meaningful ways about the work that we've been doing. Why don't we stay together and form a people's think tank? And so, uh, you know, the corporate elites have their think tanks on the right and the left. But we should have a people's think tank. And so we are forming one, and this book tour is both to share out the first product of this think tank, which is the book, but also to let people know that we're doing that. And if you want more information, you're welcome to sign up, uh, and we'll put you on an email list, at least for now, and, uh, uh, with, and give you some more information about our plans and ideas for that. So that's, that's kind of where we, the story of the book. Uh, before we get to our panelists, let me say broadly, uh, the book has four parts to it, which are kind of covering what uh, we're thinking of in terms of, you know, what, what does it really take to make an effective, uh, strong educational justice movement? So the first part says, well, at its core and at its center has to be the participation and leadership of people who are most affected by racial inequities in our public education system, and that is parents and students, students who, are, who are in those schools, particularly from low-income communities, black and brown communities. And so the first part of the book lifts up the stories and analysis and, uh, and strategies that organizers and parent leaders and youth leaders have been developing to really create change in their, in their schools and in their communities. And we're going to be hearing about some of those stories about a parent organizing and an absolutely critical and central role of parents of color in fighting for educational justice today. The second part says, OK, that is absolutely true. But we also need alliances. We need, as I mentioned before, we need a lot of other people coming to the table. We have to find ways for people to connect across localities. And so the second part of the book is story, lifts up stories and examples like the one from G2 Brown with the hunger strike in Chicago about how do we think about nationalizing local struggles? National movements aren't only or maybe even primarily about what happens in Washington, but can we build national movements that really support and strengthen and spread local organizing that has deep roots with parents and communities and young people? So that's the second part of the book. Uh, the third part says, OK, that's all true. Uh, parents and young people at the center, broader alliances, but there is something special about education. Uh, it's not like building housing. You can organize and demand housing, and hopefully housing authorities could build housing. But in education, it's a human endeavor. We really have to find a way to not just force a change from the outside, but to transform hearts and minds from the inside of our school system. And so the uh, third part, of the book is stories and strategies and analysis by educators, by teachers who are teacher activists, finding ways both to teach in a more uh, culturally relevant and community and enga family engaged way in their classrooms, but also to become activists and organizers in alliance with uh, parents and young people as opposed to a whole, uh, an opposition to them. And so we have uh, many uh, essays in there by folks who are trying to do that work. And then the, the final part says, all that is true, but still the reality is we're not going to transform public education and really create a truly equitable and powerful form of education only within the four walls of the school. Because the reality is that the failings of our public school system are really part of a larger system of systemic inequality and racial inequality in our society and class. So it's issues of poverty, of police violence or intercommunal violence in our neighborhoods, of environmental racism. You know, if children are homeless, if their parents are working uh, two jobs and still in poverty, uh, if, uh, if our children don't have adequate health care, they're not going to be able to become powerful learners in schools either. And so the final part of the book is looking at uh, how do we form a more intersectional organizing strategy? How do we create 
uh, educational justice in alliance with other movements like the labor movement, and we're going to be hearing about that today, uh, the LGBTQ movement, the immigrant rights movement. Um, so that's kind of the arc of the book. And in the end, we also uh, call for the idea that educational justice really can be a catalyst for a broader social justice movement in this country, which is what we really need. Uh, education is not just one issue. It's really central to democracy. It is central to the liberation of peoples, going back to the struggle for slaves for, for the right to read. It's part of the process of organizing in the first place. It's not just the achievement that you want, but it's also education is part of organizing. And it's really uh, critical to developing our, our next generation. And we end the book with a challenge, you know, is our next generation, are, are, are folks going to be simply cogs in a capitalist machine working low-wage jobs for the rest of their lives, uh, if they can get a job, uh, prison for our, our, uh, our fodder for our prison and mass incarceration system, or are we going to work with young people to empower them to be change agents in their lives and, and social justice organizers in their communities. So with that, I'd like to, to, to thank you for coming and to turn it over to Aida Cardenas from the Building Skills Partnership to share uh, the work that they're doing and some of the ideas that she has uh, expressed in her essay. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for being here and hearing more of, of our story. So I'll share sort of why we started our parent education program. Uh, we're sort of part of that last category of sort of these unique partnerships. Um, so Building Skills Partnership is a nonprofit. What we're born out of a labor management partnership between SEIU USWW and uh, over 40 janitorial companies and building owners. So SEIU USWW is the union that represents janitors and security officers and airport workers and other uh, service workers throughout the state of California. And um, in the 90s, the Justice for Janitors campaign, I actually joined in 97, uh, the Justice for Janitors campaign, we were fighting for full-time work, uh, um, job stability, uh, quality jobs, family health insurance, sick days, respect on uh, respect and a voice in our workplace throughout the city and county of Los Angeles and then went into Orange County and organized in a lot of key markets throughout the state of California and across the country. And fast forward to 2006, uh, the, the uniqueness of the leadership of the union always looked outside of the bread and butter issues under the collective bargaining agreements. Is what else, if our fight is to fight for a voice and for a quality of life for our members, for the workers, for the community that we're working with, uh, what's next for us? And so we act actually surveyed um, workers and found out and asked, what are some of the issues that are important to you? Where should we be involved? Um, and we asked them to prioritize the issues from immigration reform, health care access, affordable housing, um, education, educational access for their kids. Um, and in that survey, we learned that although all the issues are important, the, uh, the education for their children was the most important. It's a primary Latino immigrant uh, workforce in, in, in California, in most cities in California. And the reason they are working hard for st job stability and the reason they immigrated is for a better future for their kids, for an educational opportunity for their children. And we also asked, well, how involved are you in your kids' education so that we can get a sense of how do you interact with the schools, with, with the teachers, with the education? Do you have access in terms of language, in terms of schedule? Janitors work primarily from 6 p.m. to 2.30 in the morning. If you're ever driving around at night and you see the office buildings, the light is on, someone's there keeping our buildings safe and clean so that you know, folks can come in the next day and work. Uh, we also asked um, what their expectation was. Of their oldest child, of their eldest child, and say, is your expectation that your child's going to graduate high school? Is your expectation that they're going to drop out? Is it that they're going to get a four-year degree? What is your expectation? Over 70% said, "My child, I expect my child to get a college degree." And then we worked with um, UCLA and did a study and looked at where do, where do these families live, right? Their expectation is, and they think they're sending them into the school system. They're going to you know, they're going to graduate, and they're going to go to college, and they're going to have a better life. And what we found was that the st statistics and the data at that point when we were doing this information in 2006, you had an over 50% over dropout rate. You had 12% that actually t 
uh, took the A through G requirements and even less enrolling in higher education. So we saw a huge gap. So we said, well, what's our, we, we're, we're a union that represents workers and we negotiate contracts and, uh, you know, we, you know, uh, leverage with strikes and street activities. What does that, what does education, you know, access have to do with what, what our job is? And that survey was definitely a directive from the membership saying we have a need and we have an expectation. And when we presented those results and said, well, this is expectation, but this is a reality in our communities and saw the huge gap, then we said, well, what can we do? There's things we can't, but what can we do uh, within our organization and the work that we had? And so we decided to start a parent university program, is what we called it. And we had parents come in through, uh, you know, through the summer to receive workshops on how to read your kid's report card. What is A through G and why is it a requirement? What's a charter? What's the difference between a charter and a regular school? It's also confusing. Um, what are the different higher education little systems? The UC system versus Cal State versus private, they're more expensive. What about, what is FAFSA? What is, you know, all this information that, um, that the parents nor the children um, had or may not have access to or enough support in their schools to understand. And so we just developed the program organically based on what, uh, what they needed. Um, and in 2007, we actually formed the nonprofit. Um, and we asked janitorial employers, building owners, the community and the union to sit on the board because this is everybody's responsibility. And who was interested in a mission of improving the quality of life of the workers servicing our buildings? Mm -hmm. And in 2008, uh, was when uh, the janitors negotiated their collective bargaining agreements, their master agreements throughout the state of California. So there was five, six at that time. Some of them have consolidated. Um, and what we did is we went and we negotiated anywhere from one penny to three pennies per hour per worker to go into a fund, to go into a training fund that would allow the resources to invest in this program, but also, or actually primarily, in the vocational skills of the workers as well, that they are students too, they are adults, adult learners, and they are their first teachers of their children. And they wanted to take, we wanted to take a multi-generational -generation, approach. Uh, so that training fund that started in 2008 has, has grown, and because we are a nonprofit, we also um, leverage other resources, and so we actually provide a variety of programs uh, from vocational ESL, computer literacy, digital literacy, citizenship classes, health education, financial capabilities, but our parent education program and the work with our kids was really what really launched a lot of this work and is at the heart of what we're trying to achieve. And so through that program, we've developed uh, other parent leaders who actually do the training for other workers. They, uh, the lunchtime for janitors are usually 10, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, so we train uh, the parents on what they've learned and they, talk, they speak to each other about what they can do to help support their kids in the educational uh, process. Um, and so it is, we initially focused on access to higher education and then we started a program to address this, the young kids um, you know, the preschoolers and do a lot of science activities with the kids and work with the parents on how they can do activities at home that it's, you know, that creates a learning environment and a learning community. And our goal is to be able to have the parents understand the school system, the process, what rights they have as a parent mm -hmm. in terms of translation or what information they have, and also connecting them to organizations who are doing advocacy work directly in their community. And, I think the, the uniqueness of, of, a, of, of our program is that we are using that high road partnership or that win-win partnership that isn't seen, that is really needed, that isn't seen a lot in terms of bringing labor and management together to figure out how do you, in, you, know, how do you invest in quality jobs and how do you define it. It's not just the wages and benefits because if we look, you can you know, look at the, the, the work of the janitors and you can give them a dollar an hour increase every year for the next 10 years and it's still not enough, right? But if you support their learning, if you support their kids gaining access, that to them is success. That is their priority. And so we felt it was important to, um, to address that and develop a program around it. And that's how it was developed and so we're now, I don't know how many years now, um, into <laughs> it um, and we continue to have our training fund and we've expanded our various programs and are very proud of the, 
the parent education program and we've seen um, we had an event a couple of days ago. We had some of the parents and then some of their kids and some of the parents that are there, their older kids weren't there because they're away at college right now. So some of those kids who were, were in middle school who started in the workshops are now, you know, away. And we, you know, we help them with their applications, with figuring out financial aid, with finding resources. And those, ki those older kids are now helping the younger ones, whether it's their siblings or also hosting and coming in to uh, provide workshops for, you know, for the little ones who are thinking, okay, what, you know, they're like trying to decide right now which school they're going to go to. And so it's just great to see. So it's really sort of the, that high road partnership, but definitely there's still a lot of work we have to do in terms of how do we connect their activism and their fight for power in the workplace, translating that to fighting for power in the school system and being a voice for more parents. So there's still work we, ha we, we have to do, but uh, we're very proud of where we've been able to, to, to get to, to now. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you. And next we're gonna hear from Maisie Chin from uh, Cadre. Uh, good morning, afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm gonna, you know, say that I think uh, what's obvious and what more people uh, I think need to actually hopefully be able to pay, pay attention to is that there's a whole spectrum of things that have to happen to quote unquote increase parent involvement in education. It is a common refrain. We hear it all the time as if, if only the parents would do this. They must not care because their schools are so horrible. Um, why can't the parents just get up and demand a change? And I'm going to challenge us to look at all of that with new ears. Uh, and I hope some of you already do that, but if you don't, I, uh, I find that despite how progressive people may be on all matters of social justice, all matters, when it comes down to the role of parents in education, we usually devolve into this really elitist, judgy point of view. Um, it is ingrained in many of us uh, as like that's the reason why the kids fail, right? As their parents, that's the reason why systems aren't better because the parents aren't demanding it. Um, and we fail to really look at parents as more than transactors, you know, in a system for their children. And and yes, all those transactions have to be democratized. There has to be access. There has to be the ability to enter into the education system. And yet, when there are communities that have been trying to do that for decades and still get, even if they get in, get the worst education that they can possibly intentionally provide, even in a public system, then it sort of just changes your whole view about what that journey is. And so, um, you know, I think it's very clear that we need both, the, we need the access and we need equity in that access. And we need to ensure that the most marginalized families have that access. And as Aida mentioned, then we also need justice. And we need to, cup, you know, the book end that is, is to ensure that all families can truly advocate for their children to have a just education, an equitable one, one that does not dehumanize them and make them feel less than a human being. <laughs> you know, there are literally some kids that go into educational process and come out worse, mm -hmm. emotionally, physically, spiritually, intellectually, meaning that there's so much inability to deal with what they're going through or dealing with, whether it's structural poverty, uh, structural racism, continual surveillance and harassment by law enforcement, that you know, education in and of itself has to be something different in order to sort of take that trauma and turn it into actually your greatest strength. Um, and because schools are really unable to do that uh, and have really, are really outdated at this point and, and really conform, ask people to conform, ask people to be pretty much un inhuman in the process. Um, yes, you have your exceptions to the rule. And those of us who went to good schools may think like, oh, but education can be so great. And yes, it can be. Uh, but it really does take a changing of hearts and minds, a revolution of hearts and minds to provide that to the, the families that you actually really find disposable in society. And so I'm gonna talk, I mean, the book, uh, the chapter two, I think it is, um, is called Hashtag South Lake Parent Love. And it essentially is the origin story of cadre, um, and I hope you don't mind if I don't go through it all, but I'm actually going to speak to some of the insights that have really surfaced in the journey. 
um, because it does talk about it all, and hopefully you'll buy the book and you will read that you know all the chapters, but uh, you'll read this chapter mm -hmm. and. Um, but really the highlight of the journey is, is what I just said. If you don't take this assumption, I, the, the parent who co-founded Kaja with me, Rosalinda Hill, she was that parent, superstar parent. She went to all the training and she was that parent in a school in South Central that all her kids went to. Uh, she was even on the school payroll, you know, but she really, after we connected and I had worked in education reform for a while, she realized that all that training did not prevent it actually didn't prevent her child from getting locked in a closet for his discipline, even though he had, he was in a special ed and he had an individual education plan, or IEP. So that really throws things on its head and, and you know, we've spent the last, I mean, we started meeting in living rooms in 1999, but I would say the, the greatest aha that is still really not talked about, even in the educational justice movement actually, fighting for racial justice and all, is actually how much there's very deliberate racism towards black parents first, you know, and if, if they are their indigenous parents, and then everyone who's proximate. So if you all go to the same school, then if there are certain behaviors that you exhibit, certain manifestations of poverty or getting caught up in the criminal justice system in your family, the minute you have incarceration in your family, like, you're proximate to all of the um, negative stereotypes about black families. And then, so it impacts us all. It impacts immigrant communities, uh, Asian and, and Pacific Islander, Latino, <coughs> from all around the world. Uh, even I think all immigrants really were told how to assimilate and usually it's predicated on you, your parent being a good parent and you being a good kid. Mm -hmm. And in many ways it's a true slap in the face to, uh, to uh, many of our black families who who the trajectory of becoming quote unquote good has also meant giving up who you are, giving up your culture, and certainly giving up your, to some degree, your right to protest the system that's uh, not giving you what you need. So we at, at Cadre are humbly, you know, we've spent all our time just organizing parents. So people think the kids, the kids come to childcare with their parents, but we really are one of the few places where we really just are trying to saturate our parents with a uh, space to, uh, in a really safe way, learn, deconstruct what's happening to them, um, become you know really grassroots theorists about why these things are happening to them, the patterns that exist across both black and brown families, realizing that it's not actually because you're good or bad. This is a much bigger system that's way bigger than you preceded you and it's gonna continue after you. And it isn't about this individual competition trying to be a better parent than the next parent, or trying to judge all the bad parents and remove them from the community. Um, we are known for working on school discipline and starting and, and invigorating a national movement to end what's called the school to prison pipeline and the push out of kids through uh, extreme, egregious, harsh school discipline. But we've managed to change policies, we've managed to bring down uh, suspension rates, like, like they've literally plummeted. However, the treatment experience of, of the students who still were suspended the most, black students and indigenous students, is still the same. Black indigenous students and black students are still suspended uh, at higher rates in their enrollment in the system. And it doesn't matter if there's five black students in the South LA school, because the demographic shift in South LA has made a lot of our schools 95% Latino, or you know, 85 to 95% Latino, but it, it, it could be like five black students, and two to three of them will have been suspended. It's just a pattern. And then parents are often unable to challenge that, right? So when it comes down to just the black students, it even gets harder to fight. And I, I really want to plant to see that, that, you know, why is this? And when you, if you were to think about a child acting out in a class, talking back, being defiant, um, quote unquote, uh, not following instructions, you know, if you were to close your eyes, I dare say most people would think that, oh, what happens at home here? You know, what's, what's the thing that's not happening at home. And while, yes, home is a place, parents are their first teacher, I think we have to look at history to know that a lot of things influence actually how someone responds to authority, responds to a, an institutional environment, and it certainly responds to a place that they're forced to be at, even if they don't feel good while they're there. <laughs> and so, um, and you know, to the story of Rosalinda, who uh, co-founded Kaja with me, Fast forward to, we've had a parent leader named Rosalind Brodnix, who has been with us almost from the beginning. We opened our office uh, 17 years ago. And 
you know, she sort of embodies what's possible when you literally create time for parents to, to think about their lives critically and their parenting and their advocacy inside the schools and to link it all together and, and to actually challenge the individualism that parent advocacy really is based on. Most parents going through the same problem at a school do not know each other. Uh, most parents who are experiencing racism at a school do not ever get put in touch with each other. That's the absolute threat to the system. And so when we organize parents and we literally go door to door and canvas the neighborhood and find parents who've all had their kids suspended or all feel like the system has been race, racially discriminating their children, that really is not your typical kind of parent involvement. And when that discrimination is tied to a, t a teacher's practice inside a classroom, like sit in the back, all the certain kids sit in the back, kick every kid out that talks back to you, uh, you know, and then the, the administrators at school that actually call the cops and you know check to see if these kids are on gang databases and if they're wanted by there's a whole system that is actually under you know undergirding uh, this push out crisis and there is dropout but there's also push out and but I want to say that we at Cadre totally feel like why would this happen this would never happen in a school where the system totally respected its parents. They would be, they might not like the parents either, you know, for being, but they would, res they would respect their power. Most schools don't like parents. I don't care what neighborhood you're in, but, but nevertheless, uh, it's just always been a confrontational adversarial relationship that's designed within, that's kind of baked into the system, unfortunately. And so despite all the calls for parent involvement, when you're challenging racism, that is not what they're talking about. And so we are at Cadre Organize, we are a center where that's exactly what we're training parents to do and to do it across uh, both black and brown communities. To stand in solidarity so that even if as a, a Latino parent, your child is quote unquote not seen as a troublemaker, knowing that if all they do is kick out all the troublemaker students, quote unquote, then your child is gonna grow up thinking that that is the way to solve mm -hmm problems in our society and it has huge implications for our democracy when that's what you see. Get rid of everybody that irritates you. And then parents aren't even told that that's what their children are being conditioned and then then they're wondering, we're wondering why we have immense racial tension like we do today. Because the, 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 the foundation to lay it all is, is, is unfortunately it is uh, sowed with lots of division and individualism. And so ending the school to prison pipeline, letting, you know, creating a way for parents to fight uh, discriminatory practice inside school, for parents to, to work together across race and not make this about my kid's good, get rid of your kid. It's my kid's education at stake. Get, I don't want your kid interfering in my, you know. That is really a, 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 a kind of the kind of society we're building and we have built for many decades. So, so I'm, I'm just trying to plant a seed here that in many ways, um, it's, it's not a competition between whether the youth are more important or the parents. But I will say, if any of you are familiar with working inside a school, as much as our youth can make us be better humans, there are very few people who can challenge the adult-to-adult -adult politics and, and dysfunction that happens. And the only adult group that has no, nothing to lose but total skin in the game are parents. But very few uh, get to learn just how much the system is stacked against them. And so we, we are really training parents to focus on systemic change, but also to make sure the system begins to treat them with dignity and respect, so that when they bring up, you know, even if it's one parent saying, you know, my child shouldn't have been kicked out, you should, do you understand that they, what they've been going through and that's why they're acting this way? And why didn't you call me before you called the police on them? <laughs> um, we need to collectivize that struggle. We need to make, not let that be these isolated things that parents go through on their own because it really does. We have many parents we, who have been very stressed out and um, those things impact an entire family and how they view the public, education, a place like a school, people in their community and each other within the family. And so, so you know, I was gonna read a chapter, I decided not to, I, I was gonna read from my chapter, decided not to, the whole page, but I am going to read a line, <laughs> so I hope you'll bear with me. It's the very last page of the essay, um, and I'm just going to say, um, well, the last few paragraphs. In the work of education and racial justice, the challenge is the same. 
We don't ask ourselves to be as patient with adults. We pivot to the young people when parents are also in pain. Many parents haven't healed from the trauma of poverty and racism themselves, possibly for decades. Although black and brown parents like our cadre leaders embody this history and trauma, they also embody all the possibilities for transforming our schools. It's going to be up to them. No one else has the skin in the game to do this kind of work adult to adult. Fundamentally, we are calling for a new paradigm of democratic schools that does not rely on getting rid of kids or parents to succeed. We believe our parents and all parents can be the shapeshifters. They are the ones who can and will call forth the better angels in our schools. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. With those powerful words, we're turning it over to you. What are your questions or comments or thoughts or reactions? Yes. Um, I'm surprised that the, uh, the two of you haven't worked with the school boards. Uh, yeah. at, but public schools or private schools, whatever it is. Um, I'm the president of the Culver City Democratic Club mm -hmm. here. And I got, let's see, two, three, what did we get, four? Yeah. Four people on the school board. So right. I have that power to go and talk to these people. Right. Now, if you, I could talk, if you could tell me. <laughs> <laughs> we okay. actually know school board folks. We do. Um, do you do that? I mean, we do. Work? Yeah, oh, okay. absolutely, yeah. Has yeah. it helped? Um, well, in our, I don't know about yeah, either, but oh, I don't okay. think I don't think that leadership trickles down to practice at school sites, unfortunately. So they've been, uh, we've had some champions help us pass policy, um, but the actual what I think people really don't realize is how little gets implemented at the school site level, and so the ability to principle by principle, school site by school site, and, and to create that accountability is very challenging. Uh, we uh, at Cadre do train. We're one that I think few groups actually trains parents to monitor uh, the policy victories we've won. I mean, rigorously, like, go visit your classroom, look for this, come back, report back, you know, like collectivize <laughs> the sort of eyes and ears. But even then, um, you know, it's a, it is a, th we have to prepare our parents to be threats because when you threaten, when you critique implementation, you're also upsetting the apple cart. Um, so that's been our experience, but we've known that, we knew that going in. So we've trained our parents for 10 years now to monitor, and it's really kind of our bread and butter uh, pathway for parents to learn what they're really up against. But unfortunately, yeah, so we... So the, the school board, the authority or whatever, however you're going to say it, yeah. won't work with you? Is that well, the no, issue? Well, no, they, they do. We, we oh, pass they do. policies okay. together. Okay. Uh, we discuss the policy impact together, we celebrate together, but I think what's really difficult is getting, changing the hearts and minds at individual school sites when nobody is looking and it's not about the policy, policy when it's policy. literally like, am I, like implementing it. And especially getting administrators to challenge uh, their, their colleagues or their mm. teachers. It is just a labor of love and if a principal doesn't want to do that and just sort of be focused on compliance, I just want to make sure I don't get sued. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's really the culture of most schools, and so when you're actually asking them to be transformative and to be liberate, you know, to feel like they can participate in democracy and to challenge inequities and to um, not marginalize people that expediently they normally marginalize, you know, uh, it is a major, major revolution of, of hearts and minds. So, and I don't know how you feel about this idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't do policy and advocacy work. We do a lot of the education, yeah, you know, information, right and we sort of focus on vocational skill and workforce development right. um, and have added this, you know, element to our work. But we do sort of when there's new, like when there was actually when we first started, it was when they had first finished the A through G mm -hmm. campaign. We were sort of talking yeah. referencing it earlier. And so that was one of the first things that we went out with our parents, explained to them this is, this is what it is, but we don't go and develop policy or push policy. Right. And, okay. uh, but we do like to collaborate with organizations. I mean, we're actually in the same um, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. a lot of our parents, oh. and worked with other organizations to. You know what else you could do? do? I'm just wondering, because my daughter's in middle school, mm -hmm. um, and she has friends of all nationalities, which I think is wonderful for mm -hmm. her that she does that. Um, and if you could get maybe the kids to work together, which I think would they would probably enjoy that. I think mm -hmm. um, of all races, mm -hmm. whatever, um, maybe that would get their parents to be more involved. Mm -hmm. It's worth a shot. Yeah. It just to, I just want to add, just to add on to that uh, briefly. Um, I think that you know this has been a challenge in a lot of places that you know groups, parents, and young people, and communities have organized to change policy, and that's so important. 
But then what really actually happens at the school level is really a different story. So you could pass a policy that says well, you can't suspend a child for willful defiance, which is great. So instead of suspending them, they're sent down to the principal's office or they're out in the corridor all day. And so that's not, we're not really changing, no. deeply transforming the relationships that in, the, in the respect or lack of respect or even bullying in a lot of cases happening in school. So, um, you know, I think that we started the book really with the first chapters are really about parents and then about young people because, it, but then we do have, like Monica Garcia does have an essay in this book, sort of president of the LA School Board. So, you know, again, the movement take, has to have a lot of different levels to it, but it's not going to, what happens at that school board level, at least in my view, is not going to really matter unless at the core, at, this, at the ground level in our communities are really organizing to transform relationships and power. I think that's probably true in other communities. I'm just saying because with me, hmm. because I know these people. I yeah. help get them elected. Okay. And they owe me, if nothing else. <laughs> and that's how, that's how so I feel. You can help keep them accountable too. Then. <laughs> that's exactly right. Position. And, right. And Great. so far I haven't had any problems. That's me. Right. And I, if I have parents that have had issues with their kids, I told them, I said, let me know what's going on. And I told him, I said, look, if you could tell me exactly what the problem is with the kid, if they're not working with them or if they're, yeah. whatever issue yeah. there is, I will do it. And I've told people this. And I think that's great. I hope you don't mind if I get us to imagine beyond that, because um, in, in uh, most cases, when there's an individual person who can do exactly what you do, it just doesn't translate for everybody else. So for instance, um, the, so in organizing, our goal would be that regardless of one person that the system has changed for anybody walking through the door to advocate so whether they have gotten a board member elected or not like that's that's what we're that's our holy grail if you will right that's not dependent on a on a, a wonderful personality who's persistent and dogged and we need those folks by all means but it just unfortunately never translates to broader systemic change and so uh, in South LA schools in particular um, those parents are actually vilified. Hopefully. Yeah, because they're a pain in the rear for most people. Now, if it's to support the school, to boost to the me, school, so. that's a different thing. But if you're the dogged parent that is, and then you're trying to help everybody, sometimes it works out. It just depends on who the principal is. But it's not a guarantee. And so we actually have always seen that, and we've always said it has to be a collective change in culture. It has to be. You know, uh, a lot of times parents, if, you know, we all have, I'm sure, have contended with stereotypes of the disruptive parent who, in advocating for their child, is disruptive. But in our view, we actually think that if you go deeper underneath, maybe the interaction that you don't like, but you actually look at, at the parent as an expression of the imbalance of power that we have in this country, as, you know, like this person is fighting, and is really punching above their weight class even by coming into the office. And, and really, these, we, we know of parents who've had police called on them just because, you know, they don't like how they're being, you know, uh, there's a confrontation in the right. office. And in many ways, that is what it has come down to. So it's either act out or go with the program. Mm -hmm. And there's a, the in-between stuff is, is really the struggle because the in-between stuff is really trying to create a healthy environment where different interests actually, different power dynamics actually don't impede a healthy struggle for improvement, for, you know, for systemic change, for the truth. Mm -hmm. So if you think, oh, my teachers don't discriminate against kids and you refuse to look at the data that says certain teachers are literally are kicking all the black kids out every mm -hmm. single fourth period after lunch, you know? I mean, when a, if you refuse to look at that as an administrator and a parent has to scream at the top of their lungs because their kid is one of those kids, I mean, what are we really dealing with here? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with racism. We're not, systemically, we're not dealing with anything else. And so a lot of times the education debate, unfortunately, it functions down to sort of our own experience with schools and we sort of aren't proximate enough to the how dysfunctional some of these schools really are for very, very uh, low-income communities. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm also from the Comiskey Democratic Club, um, Chair of Outreach. But I, ha I, ha I have a couple of questions, I think probably three. Um, just um, jumping off of where you, the statements mm -hmm. that you made, uh, you mentioned that the parents uh, are brought up with their own baggage of you know, having to grow up with poverty right. and, and the the stress of, of yep. that. 
Um, are they, do, do you take them through a process whereby they're, mm -hmm. um, you're helping them to heal from the stress of poverty that right. they grew up with? Um, because it seems like, you know, that might be one of the first things that would need to be done before they can go ahead and mm -hmm. be a, a resource for their kids. Um, and the second question that I have is, what is the makeup, um, demographic makeup of the uh, teachers who teach in the LAUSD system? Because you know you mentioned that right. they're, you know, African American kids are singled out and mm -hmm. whatnot. So, is there, uh, do they reflect the um, racial mm -hmm. profile of the community mm -hmm. that they teach in? So right. that's the second question. And the third question is, um, <coughs> you know, poverty affects. Uh, kids even in their mother's womb. Yep. So, um, is there a program that you guys um, guide them through, you know, pregnant moms or whatever in their, you know, right. South LA yeah. where, where you work, um, that would help them provide better nutrition to their fetuses as they're growing in the womb so that they get to be, right. you know, they, they're able to reach their maximum cognitive potential when mm -hmm. they, you know, after they're born and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. questions. Well, we had someone else at the last event <laughs> ask three questions, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you want to do the last one with your, uh, I don't know, I don't, how I, you address the preschool? Oh. <laughs> Let me see what I can do. But, uh, okay, so yes, we do, uh, we do a lot of community building, similar to, I'm sure, Aida's group. Like, just the notion of empowering yourself sometimes is very healing, um, mm -hmm. learning your rights. Uh, building solidarity with other parents where they're not judging each other, because usually parents literally are lone rangers in this whole thing, right? And so, um, but we tend to not do it, quote unquote, first. We tend to do it alongside. And we, we do do the advocacy first, if you will, but then we have added this resiliency program. And just the way that we run our meetings and the way that we do our training is very centered on them and their story and their experience. So it's not elitist and top down, it's not technocratic, it's like, how do you experience things? And let's go from there. So we hope that that is a healing approach to even empowering, <coughs> you know, empower, self-empowerment. Um, the makeup of the teachers, so, you know, the funny thing is that, and I think, I don't know if everybody sees this in the part of LA that you interact with the most, but, but uh, it almost does, it might not matter if the demographic, sometimes it does, it def but there are a lot of teachers of color in South LA schools and this problem still exists because there's actually a bigger ideology that people are ascribing to. Mm -hmm. That isn't just about, I mean, sometimes there's obviously more uh, familiarity with the community and, 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 and uh, the struggle, if you will, um, but once you work for the institution, other things come into play, right? Yeah. And they compete with that knowledge, that organic understanding you may have. And if you uphold the institutional mantra more than you want to sort of struggle with a family over something, that sometimes wins out. So to us, like almost all the principles of, uh, in South LA are of color. They are predominantly, there are a lot of, uh, there's probably more Latino principles now than there have ever been. There's been a complete demographic shift in South LA in the mid-90s. I've literally watched all the principals go from black and white to Latino, and maybe there's some white. And there's still some black, but it's, it's, it's literally switched. Um, same with, and so, and that has created tension, obviously. And so South LA do, is definitely this interesting place where if we can figure it out in South LA, we might figure it out for the rest of the world <laughs> at this point. Um, because every other part of the country is gonna go through this demographic mm -hmm. shift as well. Um, traditionally, African-American neighborhoods are all about to sort of face migration, in migration, if you will, and so, uh, and or out migration, and so, and, and in, I said this at the other event, I haven't said it here yet, but South LA is also this sort of sacred ground for thinking about um, the removal of black families from LA, um, the push out, that's ha the gentrification and the pricing out that's happened, the criminalization that's happened in South LA has also created this demographic shift and a lot of families, their only recourse is to move out. So. Um, you know, it's very complicated, but uh, I would just say that I think it goes beyond demographics. I think at Cadre we try to have 50-50 African American Latino, even if uh, the schools are 90% Latino. You know, like we, we self-critique if we don't have 50-50. It's just kind of how we've chosen to move in the world and it's, it's more about this is, this is the only way we think we're going to build um, solidarity. So we have time for one more question, but 
Good news is <laughs> we're going to have lunch outside, and Maisie and Yana and Mark will all be there. Okay. And, and oh, sorry, and they will be <laughs> signing books. They're $15 each, cash or check. Um, and they will be talking about uh, these issues as well. So just yeah. one more question. I know you've been trying to ask your questions. So um, go ahead. I've worked for quite a while in a school district that put money into counselors. Uh -huh. And I was wondering whether you use school counselors as sort of the go between the administration, the family, right. and the teachers. Because I found some really effective school counselors who set up programs where I learned so much about my kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because uh, the counselor had programs right. where we all got together to talk about what was going on and what we were seeing in the classroom and what was mm -hmm. they saw at home. And it seems like counselors, I, mean, I don't know if they're getting funded anymore. No, uh, that is our mantra <laughs> is counselors, not cops. <laughs> but the ratio of counselors, especially in South schools, like in South are like 450 to 1. Yeah. Wow. And, and that's actually something that's come up with the work that we do yeah. with our parents is, you know, we say, well, there's no counselors. None. So we sort of serve as that to them. You know, with our team and our staff is they come in for that academic counseling and they come in for that, you know, making that plan and helping with, you know, their options or, or at least looking at their transcripts and looking, making sure they have the right requirements. So we're sort of supplementing that and we're having the parents be part of that yeah. as well. But that's definitely something that in, in uh, working with our families that, you know, that we found, yeah, the ratio is just, it's just hard. They can't even get an appointment. You know, the kids can't even get an appointment, and I can imagine the counselor having to, and how do you sort of uh, manage all that? But, you know, the, you know, but there's money for other things, right? <laughs> <laughs> One of the issues is, is yes. about police and criminalization. So there have been some recent studies yeah. about, uh, there is finally data about, more data about police in schools, and I think the study found that there are, if I'm going to get this right, 1.7 million children who go to school with an armed police officer and no counselor. And then they run the same thing down for how many go to school with a police officer and no school nurse, or how many go to school with a police officer and no or no and no uh, social worker. And so it's all similar ideas. It just gets worse and worse as you go down that list. And so I think that is part of it. It's not the entire solution to have more counsel. You know, it depends what the counselors do. But the general idea that we need to shift resources away from criminalizing our young people and into supporting and lifting them up and, and working, finding ways to work with families as opposed to pushing children out. I just wanted to add something about the earlier question around, you know, dealing with the poverty yeah. and that sort of stuff. No, I think that one of, one, of the, one of the things I think learning through this process is that, you know, each community is different and the needs sort of shift and, and I think that, that the, the stories that come out is sort of pulling some best practices and some struggles right and what could work and what are options and give us an opportunity to figure out how do you um, transport that to other areas and get get, get some insight in, in yeah. some of those ideas and I think the work that we have yeah we have our we have our program and we have the nonprofit component but we're connected to the labor movement that's advocating and saying workers who work shouldn't have to work two jobs either so they can they can be there for their families so they're so the big bulk of that work is done you know by by the union and the workers themselves to um, to ensure that they have stability in their workplace because that's a lot of the so then that's they have these multiple barriers and so that you start sort of chipping away at them because it is a comprehensive issue it's not just like you mentioned earlier within the walls of a school and it's across community and there's not one group that's going to do it all and that's what we said we said we can't just say oh well why don't you just go over to cadre and they'll take care of you mm -hmm. right it's what can we do here if we can get the employers to contribute and give us access to go visit you at 10 o'clock at night because you can't you know, when other parent activities are happening you know after five you're get, you're going to, you're going to work so we're going to create that information that access um, and then be able to connect you know some of these dots so I think there isn't one one place where it belongs it's everyone's responsibility and you know when we were first doing some of the work someone said well why don't you guys focus on cleaning buildings and let us deal with education reform yeah. um, and so I just yeah so it's like well you know yeah well, we do that um, but our kids are the are the product and are the students and we are the parents and as parents we have rights to be involved in this issue this is not uh, it's not staying in your lane and no one should stay in their lane when it comes to education right nobody should stay in their lane and so it's just figuring out what can you do from your 
place from the power and access mm -hmm. that you do have and how do you maximize this and I think that we have you know we have definitely work to do in connecting more dots <laughs> right um, but um, but I think that the issue of the the family situation and the stability and jobs and quality jobs is just one of the components of being able to have justice and, and equity in education and I, oh, well, on that we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more. So thank you so much for, for joining and sharing you for your stories and analysis. And thank you, Jim, again.